I do want to start with talking about um, the early days growing up in Australia. You know, I made it, I made a bit of an ignorant assumption. I assumed that you were part Aboriginal and part Australian. And I turns it. out, turns out you're part Fiji, Fijian. Is that how you say it? Or well, Fijian? F Fijian is how you say it. But even then, I'm not even Fijian. So the funny thing is, <laughs> this is so funny. Like, and it's a fair assumption. It happens all the time. Um, because I often just say I'm Australian because it makes it easier. And I obviously, my dad is Australian. So I do have Australian in me and I was born in Australia, but Australia is a tricky one because it's super multicultural. And then we also have like, you know, an incredible indigenous culture and, and group of people that are there. And so, and sometimes you actually can't tell whether someone's indigenous. So sometimes they're, they, they're indigenous, but um, it, it, they don't necessarily have like typical skin color. And so people are like, oh, so um, people assume when I'm like, I'm Australian and they're like, oh, cool. She must be indigenous. Um, and so actually what my mix is, is that my mom was born in Fiji, mm -hmm. but um, she, uh, her family comes from lineage of like indentured servitude, traveling from India, coming mm. across different areas. So they've come to like parts of Jamaica. So we sort of think we have some Jamaican in us as well, as well as Indian, obviously like the origin story is India coming down through there, kind of mixing and then coming to Fiji, not mixing necessarily with Fijians and then having a family. It's really hard. We don't know. Like that's in truth. We don't know. We just know there's definitely an origin story when you do my 23 and me, which I don't know the accuracy of these things, but you know, it's a whole on my mom's side. It's this like big, broad coloring on my dad's side. It is um, French and and English or British. So not mm. even really any, I guess you can't even really call me Australian other than I was born there because even <laughs> on my dad's side, you know, it's really quite British and, and French. Mm. So it's interesting. The Indians were everywhere, man. I know there's like a big mm. population in Nairobi as well. So I have a friend whose parents are from Nairobi, but you just saw them on the street. You think they were from somewhere in India because- they were fresh off the boat to Nairobi. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, exactly. And I think like, especially the history um, of indentured servitude is really like when slavery was abolished, then, you know, all these plantations, you know, not just plantations, but all different kinds of places were like, what are we going to do? <laughs> and so, right. so they went around, they traveled around and, um, I mean, I'm telling a real Cliff's Notes version of this story <laughs> obviously deserves way more respect um, and, and attention. But essentially it was like, okay, we need more workers. And so indentured uh, people that did indentured servitude were, um, were kind of like, I don't want to say that they were owned, but they worked for like seven years. So they signed away their kind of like life essentially for seven years. Um, there were certain different aspects of it because uh, children that were born into indentured servitude were not owned by, you know, an owner or a master um, like it was in slavery. But at the same time, they were raised in a household whereby it was like, well, you can't just eat for free. So you have to get put to work. So it was just like, it's a really, bl there's blurred lines there. <laughs> it definitely wouldn't pass today's standards, but it was um, definitely way better than, than slavery and slave conditions. So it's an interesting history <laughs> and one that like I've, I've read books, they were called the Coolies. Like um, my family were part of the Coolies, um, this generation that came down through these different areas. It's very, very interesting, obviously filled with loads of sadness and trials and tribulations but um that's that's on my mom's side and we unfortunately we just don't get a chance to really go back and look so long story short i'm not even fiji <laughs> well question for did uh, you may not have known this as a young person but did your dad take any heat from being involved with some a person of color back in australia yeah, I, I mean, it was the 70s, right? And mom is very, very dark. And so mm -hmm. um, she definitely tells me some pretty powerful stories about, you know, racism and assumptions people make about her, her being really dark as well, you know, having like big, wild, curly hair. I mean, she doesn't even look really that Indian. So even <laughs> experienced some things from, from other Indian people that were like, mm, you're super dark. So yes, dad definitely 
did. But in a way, I think it wasn't so much that he experienced heat. He just probably would have experienced attention. And I think to a degree that probably would have been, I don't know, maybe his perspective was like, this is fun. I've got this, Mm -hmm. you know, fun, but we have fun and, and I get a lot of attention and, you know, we can unpack that in a with a sinister lens or we could unpack that with a kind of like, oh, it, it was what it was at the time, right? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So I, I like to ask my guests uh, what they were into when they were young, young kids. And clearly, I mean, you, you were into gymnastics, but I'm not sure if that's something you chose for yourself or is that something your parents just kind of introduced to you and you kind of took to it like a fish to water or... Hmm. Did you reject it at first? And then you kind of got into the process of it. Like, what was your relationship like with gymnastics as a younger person? So um, I would say that I really loved movement from a very young age. And there's like old kind of home videos of me, like kind of dancing by myself um, next to Mm -hmm. a jukebox, just like really kind of embracing movement and being really interested in movement. So that was what actually prompted my parents to go, okay, she's like kind of into dance, but there's more to it than that. She's, so they put me into, they enrolled me into gymnastics and I just got enrolled into this program. Like, oh, sorry, this wasn't a program. This was just like basically like babysitting. It was like jumping jelly babies is what it was called. And Mm then um, they noticed some potential in me, took me out of the jumping jelly babies and put me into an elite program. And that level of intensity and training kind of ramped up. I think the thing that's so interesting about children's exposure to sport or any kind of person, music, any kind of activity is that you're introducing them at a time when the neuroplasticity <laughs> is like insane, right? Just insane levels of firing. And, and so the adaptations are so fast that you kind of accept a lot and you don't even necessarily really have time to think about whether you like it, like from a intellectual perspective, you just kind of approach things. I mean, at least this was my experience is that I felt like it was just, that was life. And I was like, cool. So like, how do I enjoy life? I mean, cause I feel like that was my running narrative, at least as a child was like looking around being like, cool, what's the next game? What's the next thing? And what's fun? And what's this? And so, yes, there were times when it got very serious pre-competition or when your coaches were mad at you, but you were always seeking out. I don't know. I felt like this. I felt like I was always seeking out some kind of joy. And so my, the, when I look back on it, I can hundred percent say to you, it was hard. It was intense. It was scary. It was really scary. Um, I, I was scared most nights but just because I was challenged in a way, but it's like, you're, you don't get hung up on the fear. You do the thing, you lean in and then it's just like, okay, next minute. Oh, I'm having a Fanta or, you know, I'm having a Coke or, oh, great. We get to have chicken and rice for dinner. And like, I've just done all this work. And so I don't know, you're just kind of moving through it. It's not until you get older and then you look back on things and you go, oh, shit, that was a lot. I was scared a lot or I was this a lot. And so, yeah, you kind of get to unpack it a bit more. But at the time it was just life, you know. Mm-hmm. So to answer your question, I think like, yes, it was something my parents my parents exposed me to. Did they force me to do it? Absolutely not. Um, in fact, it was my parents that sat me down and said, okay, we're at a point now where so I was going between the Australian Institute of Sport, which was in Canberra and Sydney and doing workshops there to train for the Olympics. I was too young for the Sydney 2000 Olympics. And so instead it was like, okay, well, you're going to have to do another four years to train for the next one. Is this something you want to do? Um, I would have to give up school, uh, you know, regular schooling as it was. And so my parents just sat me down and said, what do you want to do? Do you want to do gymnastics or do you want to do life? And I chose life. And I think I probably chose life at that time because I probably, even though, yes, I could find moments of joy within each class or session or whatever or training experience, I think it was just starting to just wear me down a little bit. And I was just like, and when I say like, I don't think that a 12 or 13 year old should be feeling worn down, <laughs> you know, I mean, they, they exist and then we do. But um, I definitely really felt tired. And I look at photos of me at that age, I like massive bags under my eyes. I was just like, I was just haggard. (laughs) You were also in counseling um, as a young person. Was that helpful for you? Or do you think that you found it unhelpful? 
so I was in, so the reason I was in counseling was because my parents were also going through a pretty tumultuous divorce. And Mm -hmm. so the counseling was the thing that actually prompted me to go back to uni and become a psychologist. Now, when I, I, I have this distinct memory of being in kindergarten, I was four years old and I had to do this counseling because they were taking some of the scripts to then like, or like the uh, transcripts of the sessions um, for court. And they were analyzing me and my mental state and things like that. Now, I remember sitting in this session and looking around kind of at the room, sort of being like, I'm in this kid's room, but also I'm talking to this woman who's sort of asking me to draw a picture of how I feel and how my day went and what's a typical day in a life of, you know, of me. And I remember feeling so patronized at the time because I, I mean, I was four, so it's understandable for a counselor and I, I think she was just a counselor. I'm not sure if she was uh, a psychologist, probably was a psychologist. Um, and I felt so patronized because I was like, you know, you can just ask me <laughs> this situation. And so I remember sitting there kind of like eye rolling at four years old, drawing this picture that I thought she wanted to see, which was like me standing between my parents, like with my arms out, holding hands with those two and like creating speech bubbles that was like, I hate you. I hate you. And I was like, I just drew what I thought she wanted to see. But I was so frustrated that I was like, why don't you just ask me and I'll give you the rundown of these things. This picture, I'm not going to give you some subconscious illustration of like what's going on or anything like that. Anyway, really irritating irritated me and I was like I'm gonna do a better job (laughs) so I thought that I wanted to become a child psychologist from a very very young age which has changed for me now and I don't feel that way right now but I definitely was very frustrated at that so I don't think that the counseling disrupted gymnastics um we didn't even talk about it actually which probably was actually a mistake (laughs) <laughs> on their part as well. But we didn't talk about any of that. Um, it was really just like, what's going on for you at home? Okay, let's write a report about this. So Got it. Okay. Um, so then you eventually went into dance. Yes. Discovered so dance, your love for dance. Exactly. And I think that the reason that the dance transition came up was because essentially um with gymnastics floor was my best routine, uh, best, best apparatus. Um, I was an artistic gymnast. So artistic is different to rhythmic. Rhythmic is one where you like do the ribbons and have the balls and, um, artistic is where you do like floor beam bar bolt. Um, and so that was my best apparatus. I had a ballet teacher as well to help with technique. And she was like, this girl has potential. If you're going to quit gymnastics, at least put her into dance. And so I ended up going to performing arts high school and doing dance sort of full time, doing as much dance as I was doing, you know, English uh, and maths and all of those sorts of things. So, yeah, that was another <laughs> interesting place in and of itself. But I love, yeah, I definitely love the movement synchronization of movement and breath and emotion moving through your body that you can evoke th- in alignment with music. Mm-hmm. Okay. So then after school, what was the plan? Uh, The plan was on one side, I had this desire to, you know, have some kind of notoriety for my skill, right? So my skill in dance, I also sung and and did drama and I had this desire for recognition uh, and notoriety, but it was like a hunger that existed like throughout probably even from gymnastics um, to be recognized externally for like some skill that you had cultivated. Um, And at the same time, my relationship with money was like really bad. And so (laughs) I found money to be so hard to come by and I had such a not abundant mindset. And I was really like, I don't think that I can pursue this and eliminate this feeling I have of like, how, where am I going to get money from? I have no freedom. I have no. And so I was like, that's it. I'm just going to get a full-time job so that I just have some, like, I can just relax and have a bit of money and then really think about what I want to do and where I want to go. And I still had this uni situation at the back of my mind, which was like, do I want to do psychology? Do I want to go and and pursue this? So I was like, I'm just going to pause. I'm going to get some money and figure out what the hell is going on with life now that I'm apparently an adult because I've graduated from high school. And so I did that and it was, 
I'm never, I'm not going to say any of my life choices have been a mistake, but it was certainly, um, it was certainly a quick lesson in what was not for me. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, what was the job? Just out of curiosity. And to be honest, I just, I think my first job was like working for a hairdressing company, but it was like, sorry, hair product company, but in their factory as a secretary, as like an assistant. And I was awful. I mean, I was so awful. They would, someone would tell me something and I'd just be so like away with the clouds. You'd be like, mm -hmm. and then I'd completely forget. Cause I'd be thinking about dance or I'd be thinking about like, just, I don't know. I can't say that this is like, I can't blame it on me being 19. I can't blame it on me. Like just, actually I was younger than that. Cause I finished high school. I, I was young for my years. So I finished high school when I was actually 16. And so all I wanted was like, great, get a job, get some security, get some freedom from, uh, the, you know, the house, the, the household that I was living in, I just didn't, I was living with my dad and my stepmom and it was like not comfortable. For, I wasn't happy. And they uh, and they'd had just had a baby. So all of this stuff was coming up for me. I just wanted to get away. And so I was in this thing doing a terrible job, which I ended up getting fired from because I was just so terrible and they felt bad. And I remember bursting into tears because I was so humiliated, but they were just really like, we just, I mean, you just haven't done any work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I mean, I was awful. I was so bad. Okay. So I'm not clear about the timeline here, but I know that <laughs> okay. you were we're at age. We're probably at age like 17 now. Yeah. yeah. I know you were working out with your dad in the mornings, but you were also experiencing some. That was skin. in high school. Yeah. Okay. So were you experiencing skin problems at that time? Were you tired? Were you going into the hospital from the stomach flu? Oh, stomach flu is at, so stomach flu is like later. So where, how, where are you getting this from? <laughs> I read your book. <laughs> the book. The book. I'm like, I don't remember that bit in the book. Cause I, I remember like explaining the uh, emotional stomach problems, mm -hmm. um, but the skin issues, I mean, they have been like prevalent throughout life and different, different phases, different things have always been some like connection to um, emotion and gut related things. Okay. So the, so we're 17 at the moment um, and we're just trying to get some money to like be able to kind of have a bit of a life. Now the, the part that hasn't really come up here and that was not included in the book because it was probably not so both it was I wasn't ready to talk about it and I don't think the publishers were ready for me to talk about it either but I, I certainly wasn't ready to come out with it but basically um, I was sort of part of a cult actually growing up so I found myself winding up in this um, some people would call it a Buddhist group but some of the things that happened in this space um, which I won't divulge too much but essentially it it really was a cult. If you look back on it and kind of like <laughs> line it up with some of the criteria, there was some real um, cult-like behaviors. So although I can look back on it with a, with a type of fondness, there's definitely elements of it that were absolutely completely inappropriate and dangerous and not good. So um, I ended up in this cult around about 18, 19. Um, and it was through a boyfriend um, that I was madly in love with. And um, he was sort of learning from this guy. And anyway, so the stomach issues had started coming up probably from about 17. Oh, no, probably later, maybe 18. They started to crop up where I would have gastroenteritis and I would, or gastroenteritis symptoms. And I would be like, basically throwing up we don't need to go through the details. We know what gastroenteritis, most of us listening, if you don't know and you haven't been blessed with this amazing experience, then please Google what gastroenteritis is like. But basically I would have that like once a month, sometimes twice a month. And that's not normal. So it's one of those things you might, you know, be really unfortunate to get a few times in your life. Um, if you have kids, probably more. Uh, it's horrible. I was getting it once or twice a month. It's not like I was living in really poor hygiene. It's not like I would had poor food hygiene or anything like that. Um, so we couldn't figure out why this was happening. I ended up in hospitals a lot um, with a drip in my arm trying to figure out. And the doctors just really didn't, they, did, they ran tests. They just didn't know what to say it was. And they sort of just grouped it as like a kind of unknown syndrome. We're not sure. 
try to rest, which is the common <laughs> sort of thing to say. And one day it started coming on and I was already attending these sort of like group things, uh, this Buddhist kind of learning. And the I started to feel it come on. I started to feel the stomach pain. I turned to my boyfriend at the time and I said, I, it's happening. And because I was so well-versed in this experience, I was just like, I need you to take me to the hospital now because I, it's not going to get better. Um, and I can't just sit this one out. It got so, so when I would have gastroenteritis and this is like really severe, I would get dehydration very quickly. Like my body would just respond in a way that was so aggressive that it would just be like level 10 gastro, not just kind of like at home trying to rehydrate with hydrolyte. It was like, they needed to put a drip in my arm, things like that. So I was like, let's just finish this quickly. Can you just drop me at the hospital? So he was like, okay, oh, instead I'm getting dizzy. I'm throwing up already. He takes me to this teacher whom we had to call at the time master. And he sits me down and he says to me, ah, let's do some Chinese medicine work on you. We'll do some massage. We'll do some foot release. We'll, we'll do some like twain our points on your body. And at this point, I had no energy to say no, but I was incredibly, I was just like, I don't know if I want to do this, but I had no energy to really get my boyfriend to, and I just didn't have the social energy to force this down. So he starts doing these things. I then have this kind of fast forward experience of gastroenteritis, but by no means any more severe. In fact, it was like fast forward to the end of it, but no dehydration, just like, you know, pooping, vomiting, that kind of thing. Um, and at the end, he had sorted me out in about two hours, whereas normally I'd be in the hospital for hours and hours and hours and I'd be on a drip and it, it would take me ages to be able to take fluids in again um, through my mouth. So it was a very different experience. And I went home, rested, was really quite shocked and also quite intrigued, like what just happened? What did he do? And I came back the next day and I had a sort of private session to talk to him. And he said, can I tell you what I think is your issue? You play different roles to different people. You have a psychological, uh, he didn't say you have a psychological issue, but he just said essentially in his own words as well, um, you are trying to be a different person for different people. And that is causing sickness in your body. When he said that to me, I felt this, firstly, I felt seen as we say now, but I also just felt so much deep resonance with that. And it normally when we hear knowledge, it doesn't change our mind immediately. Normally we hear something, maybe a therapist says or something like that. And we kind of go, mm -mm. this was one of those moments where someone said something back to me that was so such a deep truth for me at the time that I was like, yeah, something has to change. And I never, ever, ever had gastroenteritis again. Mm. It just left. And let me tell you, like, like, I had been getting it so consistently for such a long period of time that I was just willing to accept that this was my life now. And to have one man say to me after really only a few interactions of sort of seeing me interact with people, the group, different things, he was like, you are over dramatizing every experience that you have. And that is creating internal stress for you. And you're having to manage that individual relationship. I mean, I said, maybe these days, trendy talk, we'd call it people pleasing but it was like to a very severe degree when I look back on it now and it was creating internal dismay and sickness and to have someone just say that to me in one moment and then that sickness never, ever, ever come back. It was very profound. So that was really as much as I can say, oh, I fell in love with this boy and I wanted to be in his group. It was like, I think I suddenly realized that Buddhism and Eastern philosophy could probably teach me a lot more about myself than some of the avenues that I was sort of seeking at the time. And that's what kind of got me into the Eastern path. So by the way, that's the first, I've actually never shared that. <laughs> I'm still quite <laughs> nervous because it's definitely one of those things that I've definitely, you know, different people in my life, publicists, agents, managers have been like, 
you just probably shouldn't share that story because it's too much. And so now I'm in a place in my life where I'm like, I think honesty and authenticity is better. But yes, it was a very deeply profound moment. I, I stayed in that group or cult for seven years of my life and lots of things happen um, and lots of good and bad things happen in that space and time, but things that I look back on fondly. Yeah, I think we could probably do a whole separate episode just on the cult experience. Well, there you go. But, exactly. But we're going to keep it moving. Um, so, so let's talk about your aspiration to reach the height of bodybuilding and the fitness competition. And when did that start? And what did you learn about working out purely for aesthetics? Yeah. So this is like a whole new phase. I mean, I'm still kind of actually in the, in the cult coming, it's coming to an end, but um, I had started working in a gym because I'd realized corporate work was not for me. I didn't do well in offices. Um, I didn't do well in a sedentary space. And so I started moving into a gym, became a yoga teacher, then became a personal trainer. And I started working at a gym, fitness first, Bondi Platinum uh, fitness first. And I was incredibly intimidated by everyone around me because they were either bodybuilders or they were powerlifters. And I was like skinny yogi out here and, you know, I could handstand and do the splits, but I didn't have the level of strength that everyone around me, and this is like the importance of like social acceptance, like feeling not excluded by people. And I really felt excluded and it was like impacting how I felt about my business and how I felt about being a personal trainer there, even though funnily enough, the advice I would give to anyone trying to do this is like, niches are really important. And actually it was a really, it was a strength, but mm -hmm. instead I tried to assimilate. <laughs> and so being the Australian, I tried to assimilate. And so I was like, okay, I'm not so keen on powerlifting, but you know what, why don't I just do some bodybuilding? I'll lean into this aesthetic side of things. And, um, I have to be honest with you. It, I don't have good things to say about it. And that's not just my experience. I think I don't have good things to say about the process of like bikini modeling and bikini competing. I do have very close friends who I respect immensely who do that for work and who coach others into it. And I respect their choices. And I think that they are very intelligent and understand themselves and understand and have really high self-awareness around why they're doing it. But in terms of as a whole, I think you have to really ask yourself why you're leaning into doing something like that. Um, so I guess what I learned about training uh, firstly was, I guess I owe a lot of what I know today about the body and about achieving quote unquote results or, or aesthetic results to bodybuilding. I understand, you know, things about nutrition, not just because I've, read the science, but also because I've applied it to my own body and seen it happen. And I've seen it in my clients. The same thing goes for, you know, training and the different stimulus that's required in order to put on muscle and, and how important form is in order to create the shape that you want to create. So I think for that side of things, it's a really powerful experience and, and does teach you a lot. But yeah, I don't have, like I said, I just don't have a lot of nice things to say because it starts to make you hyper fixate on this body in a very ornamental way. And I think that doesn't align with me spiritually <laughs> and that doesn't align with me intellectually either. And so it's, it's over identification with the aesthetics that I think is, is problematic for many reasons. Yeah. I think what's interesting about it, because I, I also, I've met many, uh, particularly women who have gone through fitness competitions and they never have anything positive to say about the experience afterward. I know men who have like used that as an opportunity to transform from being say overweight to getting into shape type of a thing. And so I think they find that process to be a little bit more um, positive in hindsight. But what I'm really interested in hearing about, because I think all of these experiences you're describing are essentially leading you to your discovery of the what became the virtue method and so there's you know a lot of power in learning what you don't want and also learning what society is sort of 
teaching us and, and, and influencing us to think about, you know, mm. but this idea that the body has an algorithm that you could manipulate potentially, because a lot of people, especially, you know, well, I'll just say a lot of people think that, oh, my genetics are such and such, and I can't lose weight, or I can't, yes, you know, or if I lift two pounds, I'm going to, my arms are going to get really big or, you know, and it's like, no, that's not how it works. Actually, you have to be very I wish, intentional. I wish it was that. Yeah. I wish it was that easy. That'd be really fun. <laughs> People are spending so much time and effort and intention behind creating the bot, the body that they think they want. And, uh, but everyone else is kind of dismissive of the idea that, yeah, you can actually manipulate things, but I think your larger purpose and that this is what i seen in the virtue method is you you need to have a bigger why behind the things you're doing and maybe that why it could be functional strength or maybe it could be you know learning a specific skill that that you have always wanted to do a pull-up or you always wanted to do a push-up or something like that but you've never thought you were able to do that so so let's let's spend a little time just unpacking that and i guess the the, the genesis of the virtue method based on all of the things that you were learning, what, what are the big misconceptions that people have in terms of their physical fitness that could also maybe be symptomatic of their mental fitness or their emotional fitness or their attachment style? Or you know, how do these things all come into play when, when we look at what we think is possible for our, our body? I mean, I think it's all dancing <laughs> you know like it's all right it's all interacting right so it's like never I think the biggest misconception is that it can be um you know that you could just focus on one only and achieve like broad health um I I think may, maybe people are starting to lean into the fact that that's not the case but I think at least at the time I wrote that book uh which was like 2016 2017 it was like that people were very much either like I marathon run, this is my thing, or I do strength training and this is my thing, or I'm a yogi or I'm a Pilates girl. And I think that those, those groups still exist and we love to identify with things, but I think more and more we're starting to kind of go, oh, okay, if I want to keep doing Pilates, I should probably also like just take care of, you know, my cardiovascular fitness too, because I'm not really doing much of that. And actually, if I want to have longevity and, and cognitive function and things like that. I need to do more than maybe just Pilates and the same for yoga and the same for all these different areas. Um, I think, so I, I think it's maybe not so much as much of a misconception as it once was. I think now the running misconception, <laughs> yes, it, you kind of already brought it up is this concept around um yeah, genetics and and people feeling like stuck in a way. And maybe that's going to be the human state for a while. Like maybe, maybe we just kind of phase in and out of like feeling stuck. Uh, and it's not so much that it's like, oh, this is the, this is the current trend, but I definitely notice there's a dominant narrative that comes up for people where there are these sort of like limiting beliefs and so actually what drove me to kind of create the virtue method to what it is today, not just what it was then, but even though, even then I sort of dance around some of the topics, I sort of touch on them lightly. It's still a transformational program, that book. So it's like very much focusing on, I guess, stimulus from exercise and nutrition. And we kind of dabble in like yoga and meditation. And it was a bit, I don't want to say, I'm not going to call it revolutionary, but it was like not being discussed in the fitness space to think about or consider things like meditation as something that would support your fitness uh, or something that, you know, even just like mental health as something that would support your fitness. It was just not discussed. Now, I think people don't necessarily discuss it's into the interconnectedness of those things still, but I think people are more well versed in different kinds of meditation or in different kinds of mental health practices it's a much more commonly used words word but i think the thing that i'm finding coming up a lot is this uh yeah this this stuckness this limiting belief kind of issue that people tend to have which is like my genetics allow only this or i just am not a sporty person so i'll never be that way and while we have to be realistic about things and and set 
realistic expectations. You're absolutely right. What you said before, like, is like, you can play with this algorithm to a degree. You can make adaptations. The body is absolutely incredible. It just needs a constant and a progressive stimulus. And you can create close to like things you didn't realize that you could create in your body and do things that you didn't realize you could do. So I think the number one thing that I'm trying to get to the bottom of now for people is like, what is your running narrative about Mm fitness, about flexibility, about any of these aspects of the virtue method that I talk about. And it's a really holistic practice. We do touch on flexibility, strength, fitness, um, mental health, and, and mindfulness. But I'm like, what are your narratives about those things? Are you kind of like, oh, I know I can't meditate. Oh, I'm not about that. I, I just can't. I sit down and my mind just thinks. And I'm like, well, yeah, <laughs> it's going to do that. It's the same as someone saying when I run upstairs, like my heart beats really fast. It's like, yeah, well, it's going to do that because that's what happens. So it's it's trying to kind of unravel what those narratives are. And so one of the things that I say very commonly to anyone doing my programs is we're not just trying to feel better. We're trying to uh, get better at feeling into what our body needs, what our mind needs, what our heart needs at a certain point in time. So that we can kind of unpack that a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I'd like to talk about it now in terms of say a user case of someone who may be listening to this conversation and maybe they've been running some of those narratives. They think, is it something that you can self-diagnose or is it something that you need to talk to with someone like yourself to kind of understand the depth of these stories and narratives that you're running and what to do about them as a next step? It's a really good question. And one I'm like, um, I, I, I feel like my internal jury is not out on this. So let, let me, prov- let, let me just kind of set two perspectives here and maybe you could help me to unpack this. Actually, <laughs> I would really appreciate your help. So one thing is like, one narrative is we, it's really helpful to have someone to provide kind of like a mirror to you in some way. And ideally someone who's like, somewhat qualified to do so. Uh, Partly the reason I went back to do psychology because I was like, okay, maybe I can do this for people and we can kind of go a little bit deeper into these sort of schemas that people have about things or narratives that people have built and go a little deeper into the underlying things. So yes, you need someone to help you get to that point. Now, all throughout history, that's those relationships have occurred, right? We have the guru, we have, you know, a teacher, we have a mentor. And so we have a professional, we have a doctor, different people can help you to unlock different things in you. And I don't think that that's a bad thing. However, (laughs) and we live in an independent universe. It's relational. It's really important. The other narrative is like, I love the idea of people being like really empowered with their own autonomy to be able to ask these questions and let's just say be their own guru or their own teacher or their own mentor. So how can these techniques, can certain questions elicit your own inner guidance system in a way to kind of make you go? So let's just go really simple, like a journal prompt, for example. If you have the right journal prompt that is presented to you at a time that it just seems to have like some kind of divine timing in your life, you start writing these things and you have this awakening you didn't need to pay hundreds and thousands of dollars to a therapist to kind of guide you in some way, which by the way, we have to acknowledge that anyone teaching you is going to be teaching you from their perspective. They're going to try as ideally, if they're a good professional, they're going to try to eliminate their biases and always check in with themselves, but we're still all just coming from our own projection and lens and narratives. So my thing is like, should we kind of be doing both? Do we have the mentor? cool. But then we also have to be not so reliant on the mentor alone. We also have to have tools that we use to be our own teacher, to uncover things. What are your thoughts? Well, I think, you know, I keep going back to the story that you told about the the master of that that cult who gave you the treatment that ended up temporarily fixing your symptoms, but then he gave you something much more valuable, which was an instruction on what you can do 
to make sure that this thing minimizes or doesn't come back at all. And so um, I think he got your attention with the treatment, but then the real value was the ongoing instruction to make you self-sufficient. And just like with say the fitness competition, you know, you get, it gets your attention when you can see, oh, wow, I can change my body in this way that I never thought was possible for someone like me, even though it's technically not sustainable to do this all the time. But now I can sort of take these Lego pieces of what I used and I can help other people do the same, or I could help myself to kind of bounce back from, cause it's like one of the, it's like you, once you understand the rules, you can break the rules, but if you don't know the rules and everything is kind of happening in your mind arbitrarily, and you never quite know how to make it happen again. And it's what I've been doing with meditation. People come and train with me for four days and I show them how to sort of steer through their mind. And they never thought that was possible. They just thought meditation was something that was supposed to be hard to do. And it doesn't, it's not to say that people need to meditate like this forever, but it's, it's, you do want to learn the, how the, the nature of the mind works in, in contrast to how the meditation can also work. So I think, I think it's a both, a both and situation. Mm-hmm. And one thing in Western society that we sort of discount is the master slash teacher slash guru role in helping to give us these tools that we can then use for ourselves. Um, because we've been conditioned to sort of seek out shortcuts or, you know, you are the, you're the guru. And to an extent yeah. that's true, but there is such thing as people having more experience than you, yeah. that, you know, and they can share that experience. And I think what you want to look for and what you're so good at writing about and, and talking about are principles. You want to look for principles. You don't want to look for necessarily, you know, this is the, this is the format you always need to do, but why does this work? Yeah. And so I think that's huge. That's critical. And if you're, if you're going to someone who can show you principles, then you can, you can really go far in whatever you're trying to do. Yep. I think so too. That's great advice. I'm going to take that. That's really good. Thank you. Yeah. I think you're right. I think it's really interesting. It probably is like my, the Western side of me and the, and the Eastern side of me that like has this battle about it because you're right. The, um, I, I noticed this a lot. There's a, uh, and I don't want to shine a negative light on it. Cause I think that, you know, everything can be healed and fixed and everything's just going through like evolution. But I definitely think that there's this uh, rejection of the, the mentor and the guru in a way, because there's this uh, lack. I don't know what, I don't know if what, what the cause is, but it feels like there's this lack of, maybe we're trying to dismantle hierarchies in some way. Uh, because that's the the new Western way is like no more hierarchies. Like let's break this down and we're all equal and we're all the same. And I think, as you say, we all come from different levels of experience. And so I think there's a level of respect that we have to give to the experience that other people may have, the wisdom that other people may have, the dedication that other people have given to a certain craft um, that is worth respecting to a degree. And I, I, there's, there's a part of me that feels as though that that's been a little bit lost in this other side of things. That's about, let's just say equality, which I feel like isn't the right word for what equality is. I'm, I'm using it in the incorrect way, if that makes sense. Um, but it feels like that's been a symptom of this, like striving for uh, trying to make equality also means sameness. And I just don't think that that's what that means. I don't think that equality should be about everything being the same. Yeah. I I think also what you, one of the things that I, that has drawn me to your work is your willingness to be vulnerable and sort of learn in real time publicly with everyone else. And, you know, you're asking these questions, not just to yourself, you're asking them on interviews, you're asking them in the things that you're writing, you know, your newsletter, and, and that humanizes you in a way that allows other people to sort of think critically for themselves when they're listening to the things that you're teaching them. Because I think one of the reasons why we may look at a, an experience like, oh, I was in this cult, right? And then you realize it's a cult, or you realize it's a Ponzi scheme, or you realize it's not what you thought it was. And there's a tendency to dismiss everything you experienced mm-hmm. because that person was, you know, 
greedy or was whatever he was, that was a human trait that we all experience. And the real, I think the people who really excel in most areas of life are better at extracting what's useful from these experiences. 100%. Yes. Which again, could be the principles like a fitness competition overall, it's probably not that healthy to, to do, but there's some usefulness in learning how Yes. these things work and how you know the how the body can change and so the question is what can i get from this that's useful from for for this season of my life and then i'll just leave the rest of it behind and you know and combine that with something else from a different area that i find useful yeah so. i think so too i think i think um you know not to not to be too cliche but the obstacle is the way and so i think like I have found this to be the case in in most of my life is that there's the the very thing that has presented me with the difficulty at the time has been the thing that's yielded the most um the the most like magic and when I say magic I'm using that word because I don't know how what to call this I'm like is it resilience is it it's like each situation creates a different type of resilience in a way or each difficult situation. Um, mm -hmm. Another thing I love hearing, uh, I can't remember who says it, but he says uh, he's a coach actually, I think a coach for the women's swim team, men's swim team in Australia. And he said in an interview, like I'm always telling the girls like pressure is a privilege. And I remember hearing that thinking, Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Okay. That's true. Like in their case, in that context, right? Not every case pressure is a privilege, but in that case, and in many, many cases, pressure can really truly be a privilege. And sometimes if, if our lens is hyper fixated on the problem, as opposed to what is the, the thing that you can extract from this, then we miss out on that privilege actually from the, from that pressure. Um, I want to talk about some practical things. Speaking of uh, principles that I think a lot of listeners, particularly um, the female listeners, would find interesting to debunk some misconceptions. So in terms of, of booty truths, as you called it in your book, and maybe it, it also combines with why women should lift heavy. So let's talk about those principles related to that. And then we'll, there's another one about losing fat that I want to talk about, because I think it's, there's a lot of misconceptions around how you how exactly do you lose fat? effectively without losing muscle. Yeah. Well, actually, you know, it's funny because the research has been constant, it's constantly evolving. It is difficult actually. I'm going to go with the fat one first, right? Let's talk about the fat okay. one, even though you said you were going to do it last, but essentially um, you can lose body fat and build muscle at the same time. Mm -hmm. It's just difficult. And when we say difficult, that's context dependent. Some people will find it easy for genetic, re genetic reasons, some people find it easy because just their life situation allows it. It's easy. Maybe they have a chef or maybe they have someone else cooking for them or they, or they don't have a job that like creates busyness. So they're able, but the main formula essentially is like making sure you're hitting enough protein between 1.5 to anyway, there's like lots of, there's figures that we, there's a range of figures that I'm not going to sprout them to you guys. We can, but we won't sprout them to you now, but essentially there's a range of figures of the amount of protein per pound or kilo of body weight that you have that you want to eat each day. Now, if you're trying to drop body fat, you want to keep that protein very high and eat in a calorie deficit. So eating less amounts of food that you are expending essentially it's all just about energy balance but the reason we need to keep that protein high and we need to ensure that we're weight training is to keep the stimulus essentially everything in this world is just information for your body so everything that you do every activity is just information for your body and the body is so incredible it is just like constantly trying to make you better at whatever it is that you are doing and so if you are sitting at a desk all day, the reason that people build that amount, that, that kind of mound at their back, sometimes you see it and their head goes into this forward posture, things start to shorten, other things start to lengthen. We start to build muscle in certain areas that support us to sit in chairs for a long period of time. It's not your body working against you to create bad posture. According to your body, it's saying, hey, I'm just doing what you're telling me to do based on your activities based on what you're doing and giving me. So yeah. if the information that you provide your body is 
weight training consistently with progressive overload. So things getting harder over time, giving it enough protein and you're eating in a calorie deficit. You're saying to the body, I need more muscle mass for my daily activities. Therefore, the energy that comes in should be ideally converted into something that's going to support those consistent activities that I take part in. Now, it's very oversimplified science, but essentially that's what's going on there. So I think people make the assumption that um, loads of cardio is going to be enough. But if we're just working on a big deficit, then the because muscle is so expensive to our system, it's very calorically demanding. If you are just constantly in a deficit and you are constantly just smashing that cardio, your body's not going to hold on to muscle. It's just not going to. And if you're not eating enough protein, it's also not, it's not going to have anything to make it with. And there are no exceptions, right, to this. This is the there principle. Is, this is the principle. This is it. This is what needs to be done. I mean, there's exceptions in the sense that people have in very specific individual expressions of their genetics, but generally speaking, we know caloric deficit is required and all diets are, they're like, are just different ways to facilitate this caloric deficit. In fact, even really medication, you know, weight loss medication, which is super famous now is essentially regulating appetite in a way that's so profound that you can't override it anymore. Uh, and therefore you just stick to <laughs> this like appetite level that you have based on the medication. Again, I'm oversimplifying, but essentially you are like, it's all about the calories in, it's all about energy balance. It's just that people forget how profoundly our body has evolved in a way to make these um, sensations so hard to resist within us. So hunger hormones, satiation hormones are really, really powerful. And so when they become a little bit dysregulated or, or dysfunctional in a way for different reasons, um, it's very difficult to override them. The reason I'm giving you that little caveat is because I know people like to um, throw shade on, uh, you know, essentially people who have more fat, right? People who have obesity, have overweight. Um, it, this is not a moral issue. <laughs> this is like something that is very profoundly impacting their appetite and their physical function in a way that fit, many fitness people don't understand or many people in leaner bodies just won't understand because they haven't truly experienced it themselves. What if I just don't eat that much and I just fast a lot? Will I lose weight that way? Is that sustainable? Again, fasting could be one way to facilitate a caloric deficit, but mm -hmm. it's not necessarily going to hold on to muscle mass because we haven't said anything about protein. We haven't said anything about what activities you're doing. Um, but yeah, you will get to a point where you, your body will even out based on the deficit that you're creating. Okay. So how does that tie to me having a big booty? If I want to have a big booty, a big, right. nice. <laughs> right. So on the other, so on the other end of the spectrum, this is where we actually need to be like eating enough. Cause actually this is the other thing is like, it's, it isn't just about protein, but let's say you wanted to drop body fat and, um, and put on muscle. We do need to be <laughs> like eating enough of not just protein, but carbs and fats as well. Like I don't want to just slam protein as like the star of the show. It definitely makes a difference and helps with satiation, helps with muscle building, but so do carbohydrates. That glucose is helping to shuttle nutrients into the muscle that we need. Right. And so mm -hmm. again, I'm oversimplifying science here, but it's like, we need all of these macronutrients um, and we need fiber as well. So for a big booty, we need to be training enough. I think in the book, I also talk about the fact that hypertrophy is not a dirty word. And that's a really important one to me because I still feel like many women think that hypertrophy is a dirty word. Um, if I, I feel nervous when I have to say, Hey, we're going to have to grow some muscle. I mean, I was talking about abs the other day and people like, you know, I want to just, I just wish I could get rid of my belly fat. And I'm like, yep. Okay. I understand that desire. So calorie deficit is one thing, but you, it's only going to take you so far if you want to have visible abs, for example. And so in actual fact, this is where we need to actually put on muscle. You have to have muscle underneath. Everyone assumes that abs are made in the kitchen, but in reality, they're made in the gym. 
They're mm. possibly potentially revealed in the kitchen through a calorie deficit, but they have to be there. They have to be strong and developed. And so in that case, we need that muscle to grow. And when I say to women, we need to grow your butt, they're like, what do you mean? I am trying to make it smaller. I'm like, you're not trying to make, you're trying to drop body fat, but essentially you actually want those glutes to be bigger. In reality, mm. we all want that, not just for aesthetics, but also for function. I know you tried vegetarianism for a couple of years, plant-based dieting. Um, what do you adhere to a certain diet now? And, and what are some, let's talk about food principles. Um, yeah. When you say protein, what do you mean? When you say carbs, glucose, what are you talking about? What I know, obviously, you know, it depends on life stage, age, location, okay. et cetera, et cetera. But yeah. are there any principles that people listening to this could start implementing? Obviously not eating a lot of refined processed foods and sugar and stuff like that would be beneficial mm -hmm. across the board, right? Alcohol, probably limiting that. Yep, for sure. I mean, I definitely say limiting alcohol is like one. I I try not to dichotomize food groups. Uh, I try mm -hmm. not to label things as good as bad, good and bad. And the reason for that uh, is not because I'm trying to be cryptic or wishy washy, <laughs> but because you know we know that over time, if we become too fixated on something being good and bad, we can develop a relationship with food that's somewhat dysfunctional. And so often, and this is seen in in the research where people will, if they over dichotomize foods and they start labeling sugar as bad what can happen it can just lead to dysfunctional you know eating disorder type patterns and sometimes it can get really severe and sometimes they're just kind of like covert and they just kind of slowly dictate and then you have some emotional thing that happens in your life and that derails you and suddenly you're just like binging on ice cream and that creates a chemical response in your brain and your body. And then suddenly it can open you up to being vulnerable to eating disorders or to, you know, various different things. Now, I don't want to pathologize anyone or be like, this will definitely lead to this. So don't do it. We obviously have to have some understanding of what is optimal and not optimal for the body, but within reason, I think it's about saying like, there's nothing. I think I try to have a kind of um, like, door open approach. <laughs> I actually talk about this with like monogamy and non-monogamy as well. Like sometimes people that are in monogamous uh, relationships go, I'm really off track here. So I will come back to the point, like I promise don't get mad at me afterwards. So when it comes to, to things like uh, everything, food, uh, any sort of pleasure, right? in a monogamous situation sometimes when that door is closed and it's like you're never allowed to talk to anyone ever again no flirting no talking no interacting blah 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 whatever it might be don't like their pics don't do anything that suddenly makes that person feel like well what's on the other side of the door what if mm -hmm. there's someone great out there what if there's something really great and sometimes this can lead to someone cheating or hiding things or lying or whatever because they're like oh but it made it so much more appealing where in actual fact, if that door is somewhat open and obviously within reason, you have to decide what's right for you in a relationship, but it's like, if you can be safe enough and vulnerable enough and open enough to be like, let's leave this door ajar and just see what happens. Suddenly you kind of, this is a terrible analogy, but you take the bullets out of the gun. Suddenly it's like not so loaded. It's like, okay, cool. So the same thing I think happens with food. It's like, if you start labeling, like I can't have any sugar and this is really important that I just stick to these greens only and this clean food, then those times when you're feeling a little bit like, ah, you may just find yourself exploding into overconsumption. And what that leads to, and this is what I'm talking about, is seen in the research is this kind of like yo-yo dieting where you will have someone that like goes hyper, hyper strict and then suddenly can't handle it and it's not sustainable. But then they don't just kind of like have a little something, something on the side. It's like full-blown, intense pizza, hamburger, blah, 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 all of these things because they're just like, I don't get enough. And they have it and then they feel really bad. Sometimes other things will come up, you know, they might purge or they might whatever, or maybe they just go, okay, you know what? Diet starts tomorrow. I'm going to go strict again. And they hold that down for maybe two months. So it's this kind of thing. So this is why I guess one of the strongest principles that I would have is like no more dichotomizing foods. Sugar has its place. Sometimes we need 
you know, all food is nourishment in a way, all food, mm. even refined processed foods, they offer something to us. However, I would say that these sort of like hyper palatable, really delicious foods that maybe don't have as much nutrients as fruit and veg, they may offer us something that's just enjoyable for a sweet moment that we want to experience with someone else or by ourselves or whatever. And that's fine. Allow yourself to have that, release that pressure so that it doesn't build up and turn into some insane binge. At the same time, know that other foods are going to nourish you better. So this is why another second principle I would say is like, it is not I don't know if you've ever heard this light, but it's like 80% diet, 20% exercise, or some people say it's 50% of both or whatever. To me, it is 100% of both of them. They actually have a bi-directional relationship. Yes, your food intakes and choices are going to impact your training. And so if you eat a shitty meal constantly, you're going to feel that when you start training. And therefore, your food can be somewhat... Uh, supportive of your training, not just because it's providing you nutrition, but also psychologically making you go, oh, training feel. It's just like when someone has a cigarette and then they try and train, they're like, oh, it's okay. It makes you kind of want to quit smoking. Now, exercise helps you with your food and helps you with your diet adherence because you know that if you don't, if you don't train, then your food is not going to have the same level of like adherence or power or meaning to you. When you're training really hard, suddenly food becomes valuable in a very different way. And you suddenly care about the value and the nutrient value of the food that you're eating because you know it's supporting your performance. So there's, there's really an interaction going on between the two of them. So I think we just should never separate them out. And then in terms of like, let's give a third principle. Third principle is like, Yes, there's all the other macronutrient calorie deficit type principles that exist. And I think it's definitely worth kind of like understanding them, but just making sure that you acknowledge that the rest of your life is going to (laughs) interact with those principles. And so how well can you be fluid in understanding how to keep applying them without letting it kind of like completely derail you or being too rigid? Does that make Mm -hmm. sense? Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And you break all this down in your book, which you said it's an ever evolving body of knowledge. So I'm not sure if you still even, you know, subscribe to everything you wrote in your book and the sequence that you wrote it all. But even still, it's a good point of reference, I think, for yeah, the lay you know, person. I hundred percent do. I, 100% do. I, I mean, I I still have the book with me here, and I I look through it, and I'm like. Yes, I still because every now and then I'm like, is there anything that I would change here? But I think like the only thing that I would change or it's not so much change is that I would just it would just be longer because I would be wanting I'd it would probably have more uh it would probably have more writing on psychology and mindset and yeah. understanding oneself and less of the workout section at the back because there's obviously right. like workout exercise stuff and I feel like I already have that in video form so it would be more like informational because you've said you know and you try you can't out exercise pain or painful breakups and things like that. So that's a whole other, (laughs) that's a whole other area that I think people also discount when it comes to um, just living a holistic life. Like you, you, yes, exercise is great. It's perfect. Meditation is great. It's perfect. But there may be some other things that we need to look at as well in terms of becoming a student of ourselves. And speaking of change, um, you had a very successful training career you were training David Beckham and you know the cast of major motion pictures and you decided to to go back to school and study psychology so I'm curious what are you going to do how are you going to bring that into the fold of what you've been doing how are things changing and what are you learning in that area of study that you're now starting to think differently or apply to the diet nutrition and mindfulness stuff? Yeah, it's a good question. I ask myself the same thing like all the time. <laughs> You're <laughs> still in I'm process. Like, the wheel is still I'm spinning. So, it really is because I, it's, it's not so, you know, I guess this was my naive kind of perspective going into it was like, cool, I'll just like get some of this knowledge and we'll just systemize it and apply it. But the tricky part of psychological sciences is, uh, you know, anything that's like empirically tested is very, um, 
is we could say like robust in one way, but also like with psychology is very difficult to like robustly study anything because it's not like matter. And so like there's huge debates, right, in the science community where they're like, psychology isn't a science. It never will be because we're testing things that can't be definitely seen. Yeah, Whereas like- It's when all you're context. Matter, it's all context dependent and it's exactly. And so, and there are all these biases that influence things. You know, you have like experimental bias, you have like different th- interactions that can create different outcomes when you're studying like a cohort of people and how they're behaving. So- Um, You know, I love, I think that the biggest takeaway though, for me is probably um, the behavior stuff. So behaviorists uh, kind of tried to move away from like the, the psychoanalysts like Freud and things like that. And the behaviorists were like, this is not a science because we can't, we can't test projection. We can't test some of these things that, you know, Freud is bringing up. All we can test is what we see and therefore we can, we can test and measure behavior. And so the behaviorists came out and I, I still know that there is the like underworld of things. I know that there's a lot that psychological science doesn't know, and it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist just because it isn't measurable. But I think the thing that I'm trying to take away the most from this that is applicable and systemizable to the virtue method is the behavior-based stuff. Humans do act in ways that are very, um, like we have certain behaviors that are elicited in certain circumstances, especially when it comes to learning and then applying that learning. And so I think it's just about integrating some of those things. I think that will be how it's integrated into the virtue method. I'm particularly interested in in addiction and some of the interesting findings around addiction, the way that we look at it, I think maybe we're looking at it with a lens that's like you're broken if you uh, have addiction. But I actually think I look at it from the perspective of like what how else could we look at addiction in what other ways could we look at it um so yeah i there's you know there's many avenues but yes behavior is one thing and then you know i guess addiction is one type of behavior uh so it probably falls under the same category curious um if someone's listening to this and they think oh you know i've always wanted to study psychology you've been you're now living in the uk you just went back there you were in australia like how does it work are you doing an online thing or what's the yeah. So, so, well, funnily right. enough, like, so when I started, I, it wasn't COVID. And so um, at least it wasn't COVID in Australia. I think it was COVID, but it, I was like, oh, I may as well like finish this um, and like not, you know, and, and ever the world's in COVID and maybe when it comes out, I mean, at that point, we didn't know if we were ever coming out of it. Uh, and in Australia, it was like sunny. <laughs> Everyone was out and about. Nothing was there. They'd locked the doors. And so everything was fine. So I was just going in on campus. So it is an on-campus degree. Then COVID hit Sydney um, and things got severe. And so suddenly everything went online. So basically the degree became, I mean, it wasn't technically an online degree, but it just became one. And now I was like, well, I could always just come back to the UK because I'm doing everything online anyway. They obviously have the option to be on campus and I've done many semesters on campus, but there wasn't that much of a difference. I personally love to learn IRL. I really love to learn in a group situation. I love experiencing people and I love experiencing the interaction between a teacher and a student and how you can ask questions in real time that feels very connected. And I do think that I learn better that way. So it has been a bit of a struggle to make it work, but it's not impossible, if that makes sense. So right now I'm doing semesters online. And then if, and when I go back, I may do another semester face-to-face and, you know, see how that goes. But right now we're surviving, we're doing well, so it's okay. Um, beautiful. And then finally, you, you have amassed, you know, nearly half a million followers on social media over the years. And for, you know, there are a lot of fitness people and, you know, uh, all kinds of influencers who don't get a lot of traction in social media. But I, 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 I do think that you tend to be a lot more transparent with your process than people typically are. But I'm not, I'm curious what you would credit your, the traction and the engagement that you get 
in, on social media with in case somebody is also again building a platform and they want to they want to know what the best practices are for someone who's considered to be an authentic more authentic as a public persona would you say that's what it is or what, what would you from your end of things how would you how would you look at that? I, I think first and foremost, like I can't take credit, like whole credit. I had, you know, I, I feel very lucky to, I think uh, coming back to this running theme of like having mentors, having teachers, and really, I, I really appreciate learning from people. And so I had a lot of people kind of come into my life and were generous with knowledge and information as to how I could, you know, I guess in a way commercialize what I'm doing in a small degree. So it was kind of like, well, how do we take what you're doing as a personal trainer and make it bigger than, than just personal training um, your small community. And so, you know, I had help from people that had expertise in various different business areas and things like that. So I think, I guess the reason I say that and, and want to acknowledge that is that I think it's important to acknowledge that nothing ever just is from one person alone. Even the most successful people have like a huge team of people that have helped them along the way, uh, good and bad. And that has definitely been the case for me. And so I very much credit those people uh, that have helped me. And you know what, even the people that have like not, because in some way it's been helpful, you know, along the way. The second thing that I would say is like, two main principles that I follow with my social media and content creation is I ask myself, like, what is the takeaway here? Uh, and the reason I ask myself that is that as a consumer watching and engaging with content, you're not that you're not paying for, you have to remember that you're paying with your attention. Mm -hmm. And so people are paying you with their attention. I try to respect the, that fact. And I think I don't want you to just watch me kind of like gallivanting around in my life. I want you to be able to take something away from that. So what are you learning from this post uh, that maybe you didn't know before? And, you know, I can't always, <laughs> I can't always provide that. Obviously some people are going to be like, yeah, I already know about calorie deficit. Thank you very much. But hopefully I'm bringing topics and concepts that cause people to at least question something in some way. So there's some takeaway. Um, and then I think the second principle, again, this is so ridiculous, but it's like consider things that you might, that might get brushed over, like lighting and, you know, being, I, I know this sounds so ridiculous, but like don't, you know, because social media is on our phones and we follow our friends and it grew out of Facebook, which was more about and MySpace and things like that, which is more about just like friendship sharing and sharing pictures of our friends and things like that. It has this feeling of it being very like casual, but it's not just like a magazine is highly produced. Everything on Instagram is still highly produced, particularly if it's a business, even if it's a personal brand business. And there's nothing wrong with that. So we don't need to start getting upset and angry about authenticity and whether someone's authentic or not. Because even the people that are like, I'm authentic, it's like, you're, it's a show. It's all a show. Okay. The world, what is the Shakespeare it's a stage. <laughs> exactly. All the, world is a stage. all the world is a stage. And so Instagram is no different. It is a mirror of that fact, or we can't call it a fact, but we can just call it a Shakespearean kind of concept. Right. So truly know that if you're providing a show, like what are some of the qualities that you like? Yes. Maybe some people like that kind of like rough and ready kind of look that seems a bit casual. And I know that's definitely trending on TikTok, but it's like what you will still see is that there is an element of production value that goes into even those videos that seem like they were just kind of whipped together. So I think like to anyone that's just consider things like don't stand. I mean, right now I have terrible lighting because the light's gone from outside, but I always try to place myself in front of a window. I always make sure that the subtitles are in the right place and things like that are just super important. So if you are really trying to do something with your business online, your personal brand, consider those things with as much importance as you would consider the takeaway um, mm. or anything else in your business. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for coming on and sharing, <laughs> sharing your, your story and giving us your tips and principles for optimizing those areas of our life. I just want to acknowledge you again. I've admired you from afar. I've gotten the chance to meet you in person. 
a few times and work out with you and you're the real deal. And that's one of the things I love about you and why I wanted to have you on here. So I loved your book. It was very thorough and accessible. So thank you for putting that out into the world. And uh, I'd love to have you back on here, continue just talking about you know, some of these principles, because I think it's so fascinating. There's so much misinformation out there. And I think we need somebody to kind of bring those various factions together and may help people understand. You don't have to dismiss this whole thing because you don't like this person who promotes it. You know, there's some usefulness there. There's some usefulness there. Let's talk about what's useful and, and how we can use those principles to optimize things. Totally, totally agree. I love that. Thanks for having me. If you like that video, you're going to love the next one. Click this thumbnail right here and I'll see you over there.